Evening, everyone. Just as we start, I'll, I'll leave it another minute or so just to let um, the last couple uh, come in online, and, and as they go, we'll be able to, to let them through as well. Uh, as, as everyone's coming on, same as, same as the other week, so if we can just get you to turn your microphones on mute um, and uh, your camera's off, that'd be great. Uh, once once I've given a little spiel at the start as well, I'll, I'll put the uh, Slido um, information into the thing. So if you've got a question for Adam or Jody, you can, you can put it in there um, and Jay will be able to address those at the back end of the meeting. Uh, but I'll, I'll make that about 6.01 now, so we'll kick off. Firstly, again, thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in tonight. We're um, up to now our third session of what we've been putting together for our Premier Cricket Coaches, uh, and we thank everyone for, for jumping on tonight. If, if it's your first session, welcome. Uh, if you've thank you for uh, being a part of what we're putting together tonight. We're taking a slightly different look at coaching within Premier Cricket and coaching in general. We're... We've been lucky enough to get two players on um, and have a look at coaching through their eyes. Uh, we've got with us tonight Adam Crossway uh, and Jody Hicks, who are both current Premier Cricket players. Adam plays Premier Cricket currently in Melbourne uh, and has, I'm going to take a stab in the dark here, mate, but about 15 or 16 years Premier Cricket experience through... Yeah, we'll, we'll go um, with that. <laughs> Something like that, um, and is probably one of the only the few players in the country that's actually played for more Premier Cricket clubs than myself. So Adam will have uh, a vast array of experiences and knowledge playing Premier Cricket in Melbourne, uh, Adelaide, and also Sydney for a couple of years with Manly Cricket Club. And um, as you'll know, Adam was part of the successful Belvedere Cup side in in 2014-15. Along with his Premier Cricket, Adam's also uh, played 31 Shield matches for Victoria and South Australia, uh, as well as 26 BBL matches for the Adelaide Strikers. Um, and with Adam, we've got Jody, who plays her Premier Cricket for Sydney Cricket Club, the Mighty Tigers uh, in Sydney, uh, who was also a part of their... Uh, they didn't get the chance to win the title in a final, unfortunately, this year, but were crowned Premiers uh, in the Women's First Grade Comp in Sydney in 2019-20. Uh, with the season unfortunately cut short uh, due to COVID-19. Jody takes uh, the phrase elite athlete to a bit of a different meaning. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Jody combines her time being a uh, WBBL cricketer with the Sydney Sixers uh, and also dabbles in a bit of uh, AFL as well, playing for the GWS Giants in the AFLW competition. Um, so when it comes to elite sport, playing it uh, in two separate ones in at professional level is an, is, is an exceptional story. Uh, and no doubt there's a couple of good coaching stories uh, in there as well and, and coaches that have had an effect both on Jody and also uh, Adam as well and experiences they've had in Premier Cricket. Uh, as we did last week, we've also got Jay Lenton, who's our coach and talent specialist for South East Sydney. Uh, we'll be uh, interviewing both Jody and Adam. And Jay was also part of that successful side uh, in Manly in 2014-15 and again has a number of years of Premier Cricket experience to touch on uh, with speaking to everyone tonight. So again, thank you very much to both Adam and Jody for their time this evening. Um, for those of you who uh, aren't aware of what we've done before, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions uh, to both Adam and Jody. I'll, I'll put the information for that in the chat function we've got here, but we we'll use the Slido website and you'll have the option to either type in a question for them or if there's a question there that uh, has already been asked, please feel free to, to like it. But I'll pass over to Jay. Um, thank you for joining us and enjoy the evening. Thanks, Thanks. Billsy. Um, yeah, as, as Nick's just alluded to, so, some pretty amazing and very talented people on the line with me tonight. Um, Billsy was also part of the 14-15 Manly Premiership. I thought I'd get that out of the way first, just so we, we will talk about it tonight, definitely, because it does come in with the topic we would like to talk about. But I know Adam and I could probably talk about that uh, that premiership for quite some time, but we'll steer clear as much as we can. But as mentioned, two, two amazingly talented athletes on tonight, uh, Jodes, both with with cricket and, and with AFL, and obviously all of the wealth of experience that Adam has playing cricket all across the country. So, as mentioned, the topic tonight's a player's perspective and and what they've seen or what you guys have seen in coaches and what coaches' characteristics work best. Uh, we will touch on that. We will get to it. But firstly, I want to ask you guys 
we've just talked about your bias. So give us a little bit of a, a backstory to that. And and Jodes, I'll start with you. I, I, th- I thought originally you were from Hay, but you told me five minutes ago you're from Shepparton in Victoria. So I'm still listening and learning as well. So Jodes, if you don't mind, give us a bit of a background about your cricket history, where you're from and, and where you are now. Yeah, so I'm originally from near Shepparton. I wouldn't quite say Shepparton. Apologies, but, um, Victoria. <laughs> no, nah, Sherman's a different thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so then moved to Hay when I was in year three. Um, went to a public school at the um, Hay Public School and had fortunate enough I had a really good PE teacher who was a female and she had twin daughters also. I'm a twin and they were really good at sport and um, Kate and I, my twin, we were really good at sport. So she, uh, Rachel and Megan, who were her twin daughters, they played cricket also when they were growing up. So then she was like, how come Kate and Jodie should have a go at cricket? And I tried out for the Riverina PSSA team when I was in year five and I was lucky enough to make it. And so were most kids who were just talented enough at the time, didn't really know much about cricket. Um, so, yeah, it started at PSSA and then, yeah, just went on from there. I went down to the local nets and trained with the boys. Um, that was pretty hard at the start. I think we were the only girls to train with them ever in Hay. Like, it never happened before. So just breaking barriers there at the start. And then I just kept playing cricket. I was fortunate enough to have a cricket coach that was really passionate about cricket. Um, he did it for free. He'd get me in every week, every day, just training, always telling me to have a high elbow, get forward, just all the good stuff when you learn in country sure cricket. Sure, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> no, it could have been. No. <laughs> Adam's a bit younger than this bloke. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then I just, I think being quite a handy athlete in the field, um, I was an all-rounder growing up, so that sort of got me into sides. I was always sort of in the side of about 10 or 11. I think that always got me across the line. Um, I made the, oh yeah, I was playing for, when I made it to high school, I started playing in the CHS team also. And then I didn't make the New South Wales Opens team in under 15. So I ended up going over to Canberra because I'm from Hay. Well, I moved to Hay. And because it's so far away, it was seven and a half, eight hours from Sydney, I ended up training with Canberra because it was a lot closer. Um, And then, yeah, I got picked up by the ACT Meteors who play in the WNCL League when I was 18. So when I left school, I moved straight to Canberra and lived there by myself which I thought was a massive city at the time. Um, not really. Like, you can hear kangaroo in the middle of the city, so that was a bit weird. Um, played there for two years. Unfortunately, got delisted. Also got signed for the um, Sixers in the WBBL also when I was 18, so I was still playing with them. Have been currently playing for them for five, six years now, and we're a pretty successful franchise, which is really nice. Um yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an amazing journey and it's uh, there's a couple of things in there I'll, I'll touch on a little bit later. You've mentioned two coaches already that have had an impact on you just within your story. So we will come back to that a little bit later. But from a, a, a country girl, Adam, to a very city slicker boy, give us <laughs> give us your, your upbringing and your, your journey through cricket and where you've gone. I think firstly, I think Jody's pretty much playing out my – boyhood dream of playing AFL footy and uh, and cricket so I'm very jealous I think that was growing up was a bit of uh, that, that was my passion was AFL and cricket in the summer so um, very jealous Jody well done um, I said it I said it could always be done just the boys just don't have just not good enough so uh, yeah look I, I grew up Come back uh, to us. Yeah, there you go. We got you. Am I there? Yeah, just missed me? the last couple of seconds, mate. All right. So essentially, it was just start, starting from the start. I went down to a premier club, uh, Richmond Cricket Club, when I was 14, 15. Uh, I was a wicket keeper, um, very small wicket keeper, made my way through through the grades there. I was lucky enough to get picked in some squads, a little bit like what Jody was saying, that as a an all-rounder as a wicket keeper and batter. My wicket keeping definitely uh, got me picked in some of these sides coming through through the junior programs and I uh, was lucky enough to play in the carnival system. I uh, get put into the state system at about 
18 and sat behind Darren Berry, so that was pretty cool. Uh, he was a childhood hero of mine and a very good weird keeper, so was with the Vicks for a while there. Uh, ended, ended up in a, a bit of a battle for the gloves with Matthew Wade. Um, Wade, he was playing shield cricket. Uh, I was playing one day in 2020 cricket. Didn't like how that was going and really wanted to be playing all forms. So I went across to uh, decide to to head up to Sydney and uh, try and take on, uh, at the time, was Dan Smith. And my brother was a rookie at the time. So I went up there, to, uh, went up to Sydney to try and play. Uh, ran into Manly, loved it. Two years there, couldn't quite get a game. Jumped across over to South Australia when the Big Bash started. Played for played for the Strikers for for a year. Had a year with the Redbacks. Um, essentially, got belted in Shield cricket. Uh, we won the One Day Comp, which was awesome, but got belted in the Shield. And they went on a rebuilding phase. And young Alex Carey was pushing through. So um, yeah, I went back to Sydney. Uh, played another five or six years with Manly and uh, a year with North Sydney, and then decided to. Uh, yeah, for family reasons, to come back to, to Melbourne. And that's what I did last year and takes us up when I'm playing at St Kilda Cricket Club now. So, uh, yeah, all up, I've gone Richmond, Manly, West Torrens in in uh, Adelaide, uh, back to Manly and then North Sydney now finished up with St Kilda. So I think if you play 20 years of great cricket, you're going to you're gonna have a few sides. So um, that's where my journey's taken me so far, Jay. What? Billsy did mention 14 or 15 years, and you've just given yourself 20. So I will stay with you for a second, mate. You, you've mentioned, you have mentioned all of those premier clubs, and and it's a wonderful both both stories are wonderful stories. And the the journey, I guess, to get to the top level of cricket is is completely different there. But both made sacrifices, both moved into state or or to the big city, as, as Jody said. So you've seen a variety of premier clubs, Crossy. What what makes them successful? What what is it about premier clubs that have succeeded that, that really puts them in, at the top of the league? Yeah, look, I, I think the biggest thing when it comes to a club is its culture. Uh, I really think that the culture is is everything to a club. I think you you really need to start with that before you even start hitting balls and catching them. So it's uh, for me that's the biggest thing that I've seen from a from bouncing around from club to club, the clubs that are strong and the and the teams that are able to bind together um, have a have a good culture and have the ability to um, bring people together for a common cause. And I think that's the um, that's probably the hardest thing to do at times when you've cricket's an individual sport. We all know it's an individual sport played as a team, and um, it's it's whether you can get that attitude and those egos right to to mix in well and to build a strong culture and a culture doesn't happen overnight. It takes some time, but the, yeah, the best teams I've played in have had a strong culture. Um, but the, the teams that have struggled the most are the ones that have been probably on the other side of the spectrum, a bit more selfish and, um, and that culture is divided and it can, as a coach, it can be really hard to, to deal with that and to, to build that. And it doesn't happen overnight and it's got to be really, it has to be at the forefront of your mind when you're coaching a club, in my opinion. So I'll stick with you for a second, Adam. You, you mentioned there, and, and obviously we've had chats personally about it before, and I hope you don't mind me bringing this up here, but you played in a couple of Victorian teams, which you've mentioned were some of the best teams you've ever played in, but didn't necessarily get along uh, as, as good as other teams have or other clubs that you've played in. Reason why you succeeded in that space? Yeah, look, and that's – yeah, I'm more than happy to talk about that, that those teams that Victorian cricket team have – uh, what years, probably 2005 to 2010 was a very strong team. I think it played in every final across the board. So, uh, but yeah, look, there was a lot of division personally, but what that team did so well is that they were able to um, disagree privately in the change rooms and, and probably ag- aggressive at times. But uh, once the direction was, was pushed and this is the way we're going, everyone jumped on board and it was, um, it really was when once that team went out onto the ground, no matter if you disagreed with what was going on from a strategic point of view or from a selection point of view or from any other point, that that group was a strong enough group and the individuals in that side were were strong enough to 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 drive that home. And that was it was an adversarial culture, but it, it was yeah they weren't the best of mates. Like training sessions, they blokes would get bumped, blokes would you'd be swearing at each other and, and it wasn't harmonious by any means, but 
Um, I think the individuals and the leadership around those groups were so good that they were able to bring that team together. Uh, I always talk about the third man in, and a lot of the time as coaches, I think we we concentrate on the captain. But I think when I talk about the third man in, it's that that either the other veteran or your vice captain, or sometimes it could be the young guy coming through. That the third man in is the guy that is another voice that, as coaches and as a captain, sometimes we we seem to be always the bad guy, um, and you're always the one that's sort of telling, setting the direction and showing the way to go. Having a strong group of next leaders that buy into that leadership group as we is sort of fashionable these days to have a leadership group, but it's those guys that are so important to, to building that culture. So it's not, you don't have the captain and the coach sitting up here always feeling like they're being negative and telling players how to do things or what they've done wrong. You have a bit more of a broader range and that's, that's I think, is a start when you're looking to start how to build a culture, uh, making sure you've got that group of players all bought in and all bought in underneath that captain and underneath that coach. I'll come back to that third man in. That's um, it's a topic that we've spoken about before and I think one that will relate to some questions. But, Joe, it's your, as Nick mentioned at the start, you've played in two elite sporting teams, professions, You've travelled to to Canberra. You've you've come from country Victoria, country New South Wales. What successful teams have? Uh, what makes this the, the successful teams that you've been a part of? And and expand a little bit here on the AFL if you can, because we've got the cricket coaches on the line here. But but it, I think the best things that we do is actually learn from other sports. So what have you seen that maybe works best in the AFL and the cricket? I think um, coming from the cricket with the elite players in our team and like the caliber of them and like the way they go about their business and obviously with the people in our team and how our lineup doesn't change too much but I think we all had a common goal and the respect for each other like that if you don't see someone training you respected the fact that they know what they need before a game and I think that's where Cricket is so much far, like, further ahead than AFL. AFL is like cricket maybe 10 years ago. Um, so with AFL, we're the Giants, and we're obviously a team that hasn't got a lot of good players, but we seem – the first year I played to four years ago it was sort of the team that, like, um, had players from different, like, cultures and had been, like, didn't get picked up by their own state and they – went to New South Wales because there wasn't much talent there. So we were sort of regarded as the second tier team. And I think for our coach to pull everyone together and get everyone on the same page. And I know we just had this saying that was like, um, know your old, play your old. And I think that um, speaks a lot for people because my role in an AFL team is different to the Ruckman's role. And it's, me not judging them on not getting a ground ball and that will be them not judging me on taking a specky or something or like a massive spoil or something like out of my range. And I think also with the Sydney Sixers, how successful they are, they also, like the first few years when we were in the finals, they didn't, like, they weren't expecting me to hit massive sixes. But, like, my biggest job in the team was to field. And, like, if I fielded my ass off that day, they'd love that. That's because they didn't expect me to do something that I couldn't do. But they always backed me and we all backed each other, even if we had bigger personalities or, as you said, like um, a really good team that sometimes you wouldn't think would get on. I think because we all had a common goal and everyone was on board, like coaches were on board, players were on board, staff were on board, even the supporters were on board. And I think when you have a culture like that, it doesn't matter how good your players are, if you can get all on the same board with a bit of clarity around the group, then you're going to have a success, successful side. I, I love that you've both mentioned here. You mentioned the culture. And, Jodes, you you kick goals. I've seen it all over social media. I saw you slot one. That was, that was one of the greatest things so, going I mean. around. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, want to, I want to relate this back to – so we're talking now at the elite level. I want to bring this back to Premier Cricket. So you're both the elite – sports people in your, in your fields in, in cricket. When you come back to Premier Cricket, how do you enhance that culture or what do you do to help out with that culture? Because let's be honest, the fifth grader or third grader, whatever it might be, 
you mightn't think it, and you, you, I, I know both of you. You're very, very humble people. You mightn't think it when they come back, but the, these little boy or girl actually look up to that elite player coming back. So, what do you guys do at Premier Cricket, Jodes or Adam, whoever would like to fire away? I'll go, Jodes. Um, <laughs> Sorry when you say that. I know. So, uh, no, look, I, I think it, you're right, Jay. I think when you get um, state players coming back uh, into Premier Cricket, it's really important because I, I remember as a youngster when the state state players would come back and playing fourth and fifth grade, you, you would – I'd be petrified. Let's be honest, I was petrified of going anywhere near a first grader when I was a fourth grader. Um but I think it's it's a really important point that those senior players and those state players are able to come back. Um, look, some people are good with names, other people aren't. If you can, um, obviously that that shows a care for your club. I I always talk about actually caring about it. Sometimes it's hard to get to get those elite players to care about what's happening at the club. But I think a lot of the time it's just having these conversations and having the conversation say, hey, look, I really love you to spend half an hour in the fourth grade net and speak to our young spinners. So we, we've had uh, at Manly, like you talk, Steve O'Keefe's been playing for New South Wales for so long, but he'd come down to Manly training and would spend time with the spinners. And and that to a young spinner, it was just, it was elite. Um, like Chris Green's down there. And when Jay comes back yourself, and comes back and, and work with the young weird keepers. It just means so much. And, but I think as a coach, you actually need to set the table for that because it's quite easy for these state players to walk back into training and, just to sit there and and stand at the top of the mark or hit a couple of fielding drills and just be there. You need to make sure that as a coach, we're giving that player either a senior player in your first grade side and and someone that gets looked up to or a state guy coming back. You need to give them that direction to actually, hey, I want you to spend time with this person. I want you to spend time here. I want you to do this. And I think as coaches, sometimes it just doesn't get asked of those players and they stand around scratching their backside, talking to their mates, and then at 7.30 in their home. So I think it's really important to set the standard or set the set the table, if you will, to for those guys to go, okay, well, I'm here for an hour, I'm here for two hours, I'm going to go work on this. And, and Joe, it's a little bit different in the female premier competition space. Do, do you see a lot of the girls coming back? I know that it's an interesting one, and the thing that we've kind of bonded over the last couple of years is that we've both been – contracted with the, with the Big Bash, but we haven't been state contracted. So that's how we've kind of got to know each other a little bit because we're in there doing our own thing. So Premier Cricket for both of us is quite important because that's where we get the majority of our training. What do you see works best at, at Sydney, a very successful Premier Club with with a lot of the state players in there? Do you see the similar buy-in that, that Adam's just said there? Yeah, definitely. I think um, when I first came to Sydney – grade cricket like premier cricket there was this persona around like why would i play grade cricket and then or i think we're just losing you sort of a little bit there Jade. sorry mine or you're like go oh, i'll play if i have to like that sort of vibe there yeah we've got you now yeah <laughs> yeah um, I think, well, well, this year we had Jenny Gunn who used to play cricket for England and she's such an experienced player and I remember playing on the field with her and she was just, she wasn't really telling the bowlers what to do and because she's a bowler herself. She was up. I think we're, we lost Joes for two seconds. I, I, I want to come back to that. So Joes will... Doing. And I think that's a experienced girl there. Yeah, no, okay. We're, we're getting you back. So back to, back to um, is it Jenny Gunn? So she was back Jenny and, and helping bowlers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so she was helping bowlers, but she wasn't telling them how to set fields. She was asking them, like, why are you setting fields and where are you going to bowl? Like, she wasn't telling them if it was the right or the wrong answer. Like, she was just giving them a learning on the field. And that, that was something I was like, how come I never – learned this growing up like I remember going to the sixes like my first session and like the coaches would say a couple of things or like just players would make comments and I was, I was like holy shit I wish I learned at least club cricket 
We just we just got the so end of that. I'm gonna that I'm ahead. gonna come back to that, right, Jodes. I'll let you I'll let I'll the internet go for two seconds. I just keep my thoughts to myself. I just I have an idea of the moment the players don't come. To well, I'll come back to you in two seconds because I want to hear that because I think that's very a very strong message that you're saying. So we'll let your internet just kick in a little bit in in the middle of Lane Cove. There, it, it makes you feel like you're at the back of hay or something. But actually, yeah, mine's all in hay. Um, so I will come back to that. But Adam, I'll, I'll go to you until Joe's internet comes up a little bit. What what do you both you are going to answer this question? But obviously, I want to come back to the um the other thing we're talking about then. But what do you as a state player expect from a premier cricket club and, and, and training and a coach? What do you want? Because I know it's not just all, I, I don't want to lob or I don't want to rock up. It's I know that you guys want to get back there and help out and train, but what, what do you actually expect a coach to to help you with or, or to tell you to do? I know you mentioned maybe telling someone to go and do this, but if you're working on your game, what do you expect? Yeah, look, I, I think that that's a um, – I always use getting back to club – club training as an extra session to be able to get there and to work on something that I was working on. If it was, if I needed to work on my forward defense, I'd get there and do a drill. Like it was, you still wanted to make it. And I think the key is as well, when these state players come back into club training, that they are given the ability to actually go and work on their own game as well. Like it is a hard balance between, yes, we want, we want somebody to come and coach and to work with these players, but there is also that side that, these players want to come back and it's and it's good to see it's good to be able to show a player like for Jody to go back and to uh train at her club the the idea of seeing the younger players seeing how she goes about it how the best players train what they're doing and Jody really touched on some really good points in regards to asking questions and speaking about the game I think it's something that's probably lost a little bit these days is that not a lot of players love actually talking about it and why do you do this and why do you do that and becoming inquisitive and I think when you see a good player train I remember walking into to premier cricket and watching these senior guys train when you come through junior cricket and you go wow this is you do you do watch it and as a as a young player you, you watch and you emulate and if your senior players or your state players come back and they waltz around and they they're on their mobile phones during training or if they they have their hit and they don't do throwdowns or they don't throw to someone else, it, it gets noticed and, and players notice that. And again, that's a part of the culture that we're talking about, that it's being able to set the standard and set the um, the way you go about it. And it, it, it's sometimes difficult balance to get because you don't want to burn out your state players when they've been training all day and come into, come into training at the end of the, at the end of the night. So it's a, it's a really hard balance to get right. Yeah. And is that, I think it's more for the younger state player and there might be some coaches on the line tonight that have a rookie contractor player in their system. They're keen as mustard to play cricket, but also you understand that they're training four times, five times a week in the cricket and well set up. You just talked about the, the burnout there. How do you kind of, how do you say no to an elite player and, and get them to still be at training without them completely going away? Like there's, it's, yeah. a, it's a difficult situation there. What, what do you suggest there? Yeah, look, I, I think this is a really hard thing to manage and it's something that uh, it comes down to communication. You need to speak to the player. You need to probably speak to the player before they get to training, so a phone call on the way in or uh, or a text message to make sure they're coming or whatever. Don't be afraid of giving these players a night off as well. Like It's fine for them not to come or to, to rock up for, for dinner afterwards, whatever it is, but when they're there, the burnout factor is a is a big thing. You don't want it to become a chore that they've got, oh, I've got to go to club training or, oh, I've got to play on Saturday. Like, you don't want that. You want it to be enjoyable. So you've got to make sure that it's not always take, 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 that we've got to give back to that player and to, to make sure that you're working with him. And, and a lot of this just comes down to communication, communicating with, especially if you've got a young bowler, how much have they been bowling? Like, how much have they been doing at the nets? Like, have they been hitting balls for four hours that day? Um, how, whatever it is, you just the communication is just key. But it's also communication two ways. Like it needs to be if you've got young rookies that are doing everything they can to play for New South Wales that, hey, you're coming back and what are we getting out of the session? Okay, well, if you're not going to do skills, I, I really want you to work on A, B, and C. I really want you to work with um, X player, Y player, uh, whatever it is, uh, just the communication needs to be there. Don't just allow it to roll on because 
a lot of the time players will roll in, roll out. With It's just like any planning that we do with cricket that that elite player needs to be planned for as well. Yeah, I completely agree there. We've got Jodes back. Welcome. Um, so, Jodes, let, let's hit us off at, the, at, at talking about Jenny Gunn and the bowling because I think there's a really powerful message in there about, about what she did when she came back, an international cricketer coming to Premier Cricket. Yeah, I think um, just the way that she spoke to the girls and she was approachable and she was sort of questioning them in a way that they would learn from it. And there was never really a wrong answer. It was just like, if you set that field, where are you going to bowl? And then if they do stuff, I'd be like, did you mean that? Or like, cause not everyone can bowl in, like no one's going to hit the same spot six times unless they're a freak. But yeah, um, I think just her, like the way that she was teaching players on the field, like you can get told so much, like how often do you see kids where like they, they go, what field are you going to set? And they're like, oh, well, my dad told me this or my coach told me this. And it's like, do you actually know why you're doing things? And I think, that's a good learning and that's something that I sort of learned from Jenny. So when I go into a game, I sort of try and help people with like a past experience or just little things that I wish I learned a bit earlier. And Jodes, I'm, go- I'm going to go straight back to you. The question that I asked Adam, what what do you want from coaches when you go back to premier cricket? You, you personally, yourself, you want to work on your game. And as I mentioned before, you're, you're out there and I see you in the, in the nets training by yourself during the day because of how hard you want to work to get into a breakers squad or to play for the sixes. So what do you want from club training? I think just time in the middle. That's something that I often reasons I don't get selected for squads is because I haven't made enough runs and it's hard. I like that time in the middle, it's hard because I'm always sharing between playing in teams where like for the big bash, for instance, I'm never really bat. So how am I going to have time in the middle? Or like a training, there's no point. Like we do get time in the middle, but what's the point me spending the whole session in the middle when it's more likely going to be top six that are actually facing balls? So And I also have to share my workload with AFL. So mine's just like feeling comfortable and not having that pressure of like, oh, you're coming back, you're a sixes player, like you're here, you're just going to dominate because everyone knows going back to grade cricket is actually really hard chasing grade cricket because it's – just a different level like I don't know sometimes the ball bloody bounces twice like I think just making them feel comfortable and letting them know get like letting them learn what they need to get out of club cricket I reckon that's the biggest thing just letting them feel comfortable relaxed and that's everyone knows when you're relaxed you're playing your best cricket 100% couldn't agree more and Jones I'm going to stay with you for two seconds here so you mentioned there, and you're an exception, and there's probably, you could tell me, five, six girls that do the WBBL, AFLW, probably less. Is there now? Yeah, so, a lot less now. So yeah, so there's hardly hardly any that do that. And by no means am I comparing AFLW here to kind of local, local AFL or rugby league or whatever it might be. But how do you manage cricket, AFL, sixes, AFLW, premier cricket, club AFL, because there is a lot of kids out there that are playing rep football or rep soccer or rep AFL as well whilst they're coming to cricket training. So for the coaches out there, how do you personally manage that? I think the biggest thing I learned was trust the system. You know how you always think you need to be doing extras. You're like, oh, I'm not feeling fit right now. I'm feeling like a bit lethargic and that. And like, you're like, well, I'll go for a 5k run or something. Like just trust the processes that the SNC and the coaches are put in because Actually, having a day off is really good for your body and recovery mentally, physically. Um, I think that's the biggest thing I've learned. And communication, I'm not very good at communicating, but I've had to learn. And time management, also something I'm not very good at, but I think they're the biggest factors. Um, Having a good relationship and trust that they trust that you're doing the work when you're not at training, because sometimes you have to do training by yourself. And I think the team has to trust that you're doing the work the coaches you have to trust yourself and you also have to be committed and you have to miss things that you might you normally would do or like you can't just hang out with your mates all the time there's a lot of sacrifice you have to make and I think that's probably been the hardest thing always having to choose between AFL and cricket (laughs) so and as you mentioned there it's it's obviously it's a wonderful story again and the sacrifices you make to do what you're doing so I'm going to kind of segue now into a coach's perspective, when you talk about communication there, 
have you is that straight to a coach and if it is has there ever, ever been kind of someone that's said no I guess or, or someone that kind of bites back a little bit and if so how have you dealt with that it's probably not them saying no it's me assuming they'll say no and not bothering to ask yeah. and then them being like how come you didn't just ask or like we could have figured out a different way around this and that's just me being too shy to ask the question but all all you have to think is all they're going to say is no like that's the worst answer they're going to say so that's something that I've struggled with a bit speaking up if like maybe I'm struggling a bit with training or doing both the sports I think you've got to ask if you can have this session off or can I leave earlier to get to the next session and I think when they do know like when they do say no you have to respect their decision too like they're both franchises they're businesses they're trying to make money they're paying both they're paying they're both paying you see so you got to be there so you also have to respect the decision that they might have to make 100%. Um, going to move on now to, I guess, it, it's, it does segue out of that as well, Jodes, but over to you, Adam. What what characteristics, and Jodes' story is probably a really good example, and, and we will come back to it, but what characteristics do you see from a good coach that might say, yes, let's work around this or let's have the chat? Do, do they go out there and have the chat? Do they need to be pushed to have the chat? Talk to us about some of your best coaches and, and what their characteristics are. Yeah, look, I think they're really good points. And I think communication is obviously a, a massive one. If we're, as a coach, we, we have knowledge that we need to communicate over to a player. And that's that, that's probably your biggest one. But being uh, relatable, um, being approachable, Jody said it before, being approachable as a coach, I think is, is massive. It's I've played in teams where, I've known I've been under the pump and I've been close to being dropped and I haven't gone to the coach because I just feel like he's against me or I feel like he's he's going to if, – if he knows that I've got an issue with, with my forward defence or I feel like I'm, my balance isn't there, for instance, that by speaking to the coach, I, I put myself in a worse position. And, and that, I don't think that's a great place to be. And as a player and as a coach, like you want to be – able for your players to come to you. And I think it's hard at, at Premier Cricket when we talk about it is sometimes we're picking teams or we're on the selection committee as a coach. Um, how do you work around that? That's, that's a tough it's a tough thing, but it's a thing that's there. That uh, So being approachable, not always being the grumpy guy, I must admit, or grumpy girl. Like whatever, I think the coaches get a bit of a um, – we get a bit of a bad rap because we're always the ones that are giving direction and speaking. I think it's a really hard balance to be firm at times, but also picking and choosing when you, when you lose your mind and when you, when you raise your voice or when you like, it's, it's hard because you see, I, I find AFL coaches very funny where you see them a full head of hair before they're uh full head of coloured hair before they become a coach and it, it's grey very quickly with the stress and the the anger that happens. But um, but I, I think there's a lot to be said for that. Like, I, I think we've got to understand as coaches that players make mistakes and it's okay. Like As soon as we understand as players that it, it's okay to make a mistake, you become uh, – you start to have, build a relationship with that player as a coach. It's like, hey, we've all hit one down deep in wicket's throat. Yep. We've all tried to clear long on and we haven't done it. Yep, we've all tried to dash away from a cover drive and nicked it to second slip. Every one of us has done it. It's um, it's being able to to teach and communicate to the, those players. I think that they're they're my biggest one. Being calm, being re- relatable, approachable. Um, that they're, they're I think the biggest ones. I'm going to take you back down memory lane a little bit here, Crossy, but go back to 15, 16, 17-year-old Adam Crossplate. You're obviously a very talented kid. You're playing seconds. You're playing some first grade around that time in interstate cricket when you're 18. When you've gone to Richmond, what was it about the coach that may have really stuck out that made you stay there? Or what do you think you would have liked to hear as a 14, 15-year-old? Because in the female game, there's obviously a lot of younger players coming in. They might be a little bit shy to talk to an adult. What what do you feel like you needed or you would have liked or what happened? I, I look back on the early stage of my career and I found that 
Uh, look, the, my, my first coach, who's actually, funny you say it, 20 years later, is actually the batting coach at St Kilda now. So he's still around in my life, which is pretty cool. But uh, he he was open. He was he was friendly. He was sharing a joke, which was made me relax. But, and I found that that senior group of players, I, I look back and a lot of the best coaching I've ever got has been from players that have been playing with me. Uh, and I think that the best coaches that I've had have been able to work with those senior players to work like they haven't been threatened by other people telling a player what another player something like having a conversation. It's a sometimes I think when we you see dictatorship type coaches that it's this is the only way that it can be done and this is the way we do it because this is what we did back in my day. Um, it, it's a, a lot of the time your your best learnings come from situations like. My, my old man had one of the best sayings that stuck with me forever that it's the best mistakes that the best mistakes you can learn from are other people's mistakes and that sort of comes back to what Jody was saying before like by speaking by players speaking to other players and by coaches discussing what happened and, and having a bit more context to to these things that's where your learnings come like it you don't learn by put your foot to the ball and keep your elbow up. You don't learn like that. Like it's all I know that the best players that I've seen don't learn like that. Situational learnings and situational discussions, I think are, are really a key to get through to a player because every player is different. We, we all know that players uh, play differently and they think differently, but discussing and having those open communications through that. And again, I just think it comes back to the coach being able to set the table for that situation, be able to set it up, set up conversations between players. A lot of times your best batter or your best bowler might not be an over-communicator as well. Jody said she's the best player in her team, and she's I'm, – I'm saying that Jody's the best player in her team. But Jody said she's not a great communicator. But sometimes the – the coach needs to set the table to set a player A up with player B to discuss it and to talk about it. And you need a little bit of a, a pin because we know how much well, I can hear already, how much knowledge that Jody has that she'd be able to have those conversations with those other players. And that's as a coach, sometimes our, our biggest strength is to be able to use what's around us rather than always blowing the whistle and yelling at people. hundred percent. And so Joe's before I go to you, I'm going to ask you a very similar question, if not the same, but, so, Crossy, there you're really emphasising how strong relationships are. So, building that relationship with the player early on, getting to know them, and then getting to know different people, different perspectives, different personalities. And as you say, let's pin player A with player B because we might get some more learnings out of them. I think that's a really strong message that's coming out of both of you tonight. And and so, Joe's again similar question to Adam with a slight tweak, being from the country. Coming from the country into Canberra that you did when you came to get a professional contract, what was it in Premier Cricket or in the media that really helped you from a coach? What were the characteristics of those coaches that made you, you're not only moving to play cricket somewhere different, but you're moving your whole life there. So you're uprooting everything and going away. So what, what really helped you in that stage? Um, I think the biggest thing was being accountable. Like um, your mum's not there to tell you you have cricket training or like your sisters or that'll be like, why aren't you at cricket training because you were too lazy to get ready or something. I think you have to be accountable. And the biggest thing I've learned because I've had a lot of coaches is that you've been chosen for a reason. I find a lot of coaches try and coach the look of the sport. They want it, they want it to look good. They always want it to look good. And that's why I love – how unique Steve Smith is because it doesn't have to look good. It has to be effective. And I know when I've struggled in the past with, I still am struggling a bit with like, but it didn't look good. And I have a very good coach at the moment. He's like, yeah, but like you just got one run easy. And I'm like, yeah. So the way he coaches cricket to me, he's a really realistic person. And um, I think also in AFL, you, while like you've been selected, when you're 18 for some talents that you have, why would you try and coach what they're originally good at and change it to something that you want that works for you? But you might be say six foot something and I'm only five foot. So it's not going to work for me. Like everyone has their own unique way of playing. And I think as Adam said, like everyone's different. That's why sports so good. If everyone was the same, it'd be boring. You'd just be like watching a Lego movie or something. I don't know. Something (laughs) stupid like that. (laughs) Um, yeah, I think just 
And if you're always telling someone something's wrong with their technique, they're going to start second guessing themselves, especially like the older you get, like you basically just keep the things that make you happy when you're batting, like your natural bat, bat path or the way that you play certain shots is why you're in the team in the first place. And I think that's something you have to reiterate a lot with players. Like they might need changing technically, but I think trying to turn every player and coach is saying, but this is how I coach it. This is how I do it. It's like, well, well done, but you're not playing anymore, are you? Like, <laughs> I think you have to be able to communicate with the player in both, I think, um, agree on a technique that's in the middle that they're satisfied with. Yeah, it's um, some absolute pieces of gold nuggets there, Jones. And and as as Adam did say, like it's you've you've mentioned before that you probably your strong point isn't communication, but just through the last thirty seconds there, I've learned so much about what your thought processes are going into cricket and and AFL and. How a coach, if a coach gets that out of you and goes, well, hey, Jodes, go go to the 15, 16 year old girl that's moved from the country because you share a similar story, they might open up to you and therefore get the best cricket out of you. So I think some really, really powerful messages there from, from both of you. I'm gonna ask a couple more questions. We've got a couple of questions that have come in from everyone that's on the line. One thing, and yes, Adam, we will talk about the 14, 15 Manly Premiership <laughs> soon, but what so give us, give us. You mentioned Jodes mentioned a uh, school teacher back in the day that really stands out and a coach during your upbringing. Adam, give us one coach that really stands out and what really stands them out from everyone else. Yeah, look, uh, to be honest, I, I've had some really, really good coaches over my life, which has been, which I've been lucky with. Um, the two that probably stand out the most would be Greg Shippard and Sean Bradstreet. Um, probably my two longest coaches. Um, Greg Shippard was, I think we know that he's, how good he is and he's amazing. But Sean Bradstreet was a coach of Manly for a long time. And um, he's probably the, the most personable, uh, the one that you felt cared the most. Um, he was the one that was really, you, you knew he was in your corner. Um, I, I think as a coach, if we, if your players are, if your player gets nervous when he when you come to his net to watch them bat, you know that there's something there's something wrong. When 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 conversations will stop when the coach rocks up, there's something going on that you need to get you get into. So for me, Sean was one of the best at um, being able to break down barriers. Still, have, you've still got to have that distinguish this a, a plain line that is coach and player that that definitely needs to happen, but. It doesn't happen. Have to happen twenty four seven. There's no reason that you can't be friendly with players outside of cricket. But then when cricket turns on, it's it just being able to manage that that personable side is is really really important. I think. But um, yeah, look, I, I think I really felt like uh, Sean, and I felt like that with a lot of coaches that have been like the people are on your side. And when, when you feel like your teammates are with you and your coaches are with you and your club is with you and your state is with you, you, you perform a lot better. Uh, when you feel like, uh, cross his batting again, you watch him nick another one and we're going to put him back in a second grade. Like when, when that's happening, you know, that's happening as a player. Um, I think it's the key to a key to being a really good coach is to be able to grab that player. Who's potentially on the brink of that and to find the way to put them into the right headspace. And if, and if you can get good at that, your players and your club are going to be in a much better position than, than, whoa, hey, I'm going to go watch, I'm going to go watch Jay bat in the net today because he's nicked a couple lately. And you know what? He's under the, he's under pressure. So I'm going to stand behind his net or in front of his net at the top of the mark. As a player, we know where the coach is at all times. You know, he's over there. You know, he's watching your field and drill. You know, he's watching your net. You know, he like, but being able, be able to have that, relatable um, and be able to have that ability with your players to, for that not to happen. And if it does happen, that's, uh, that's what I mean. That's what I said at the start. Culture takes a long time to, to build. And these things, they need to be, they're not, culture isn't a mistake. It's deliberately done. And to build a good culture is deliberately done. And that's, uh, and that for me in every team that I've ever played in, that's been any good, the, the cultural aspect of it and the coaching aspect of it was deliberate. It wasn't by accident. And I think that's a really, a really big key. 
Yeah, I'm going to just two minutes, Jones. We're going to talk about Manly here quickly because only because Adam's mentioned the coach of, of Manly at the time. So 14-15, pretty special year for Manly, obviously. Club championships, four out of five grades in the final two premierships. Pretty unheard of scenes in, in a premier cricket setup. Do you put that down highly to what Sean did and, and how Sean went about those relationships and then did that feed into the, the playing group? I think Sean had a massive impact on it, but I also think our captain, Tim Cruikshank, um, had a huge impact. And we got a couple of recruits in from North Sydney that year in Nick Bills and Jay Lenton, which helped. Um, but, no, it it was a, the best thing about that group and that side was that it was a it was a collective. It, people bought in. We had state guys coming in. So O'Keefe was coming in and out. Um, we had a young bowling lineup. We had probably a more experienced batting lineup, and we had a captain that sat at seven and di- just directed the ship. Um, had a great off-field team. Uh, the Manly committee was amazing. The coach. It, nobody had full total control. It wasn't a dictatorship. It was. Uh, everyone was on board. We had, yes, we had some skilled and talented players, but I think the culture that built, but again, that culture in 14-15, we won the comp in 14-15, but that culture to build that started probably six or seven years before that premiership. And we had some semifinal losses and we had some years we missed the final, but it was a constant build to the point that it was a, players would step into that, that mold and uh, Jody said it before you knew what your role was and you knew how to play it and you knew when it was time to stand up and you knew that you knew that you had the backing of, of the group and in that team the, the two of the biggest players in that squad were two guys that didn't play in the final were, were the middle middle to lower ranked players in that group that still had as much buy-in to that premiership uh, Luke Edgel and Justin Cox two of the guys that I always remember that had as much buy into that side that that missed the final and didn't play in the final, but um, it was just to me it showed how strong a group it was because it was it was all pushing in the same direction and they had uh, there wasn't one person leading it like Sean was directing it sure Tim was in charge of what was going on but we had in that team you probably had I call it third man in in that team you probably had third fourth fifth all the way down to to eleven really so it was. It was a culture that was built over a long period of time. It wasn't just a one-off year. And the fact that first grade were performing led into the grades, and did you find that that season that your fifth, fourth, third graders, second graders all kind of looked up to first grade a little bit and they also bought into that culture? Is that something that you see in, in that 100%, year? 100%. Because of the, it's the filter down. When, when second grade see the first grader firing and that they're – they're focused and they're training well. And the the we always had a, a Thursday night team session, like team fielding session before uh, before the end of the night, and every team was red hot. And that was a that was almost our switch on time for going into game time. But and you're right, like that that team, they have five teams in finals and four in grand finals. You're not stacking teams down the list. Like it's everyone playing at their max. The culture was good. The club championship was a massive like that was a massive night, and it was. It was good socially. It was good culturally. Um, but it was uh, the biggest lesson from that team and that group and that and that team was that that was the ultimate 14-15 of what we won. But that that culture was built for so long and stacked on top of each other and year on year. And like I remember when I got to Manly, I got to Manly in 9-10 um, and we were almost dead last and infighting and it, and it, it wasn't – wasn't a great place that I must admit that I walked into. And I think that anyone at Manly at that time would have said the same, but slowly and surely you start putting things in place and start building cultures and start um, working together towards a common goal. Uh, We we wanted to win four premierships. We only won the one, but it was a culmination of stacking culturally on top of, on top of each other. And as I said, it takes a long time, but it, it was deliberately done. And I think that, and you look at any successful team, and it's it's usually deliberately done in in any sport and in any grade. In yeah. my opinion, Jones, I said we'll talk for two minutes. We went for about four. Apologies, but uh, so I'll ask you ask you the same question. What what coach stands out for you? You've mentioned a couple. You can mention them both. But what what was it about them that stood out for you? Um, I think Anthony Clark Clarky would have to be 
the mm-hmm. coach that stands out to me the most other than um, David Davies, the guy that coaches to me and hey, love him. But um, he obviously is in hay at the moment. Um, but yeah, Anthony Clark, he just has this way with certain plays where he just keeps it simple. Cricket's cricket. Outside cricket is outside of cricket. And he has that really good balance. And he never like forces his opinion or his way of how to play the game on you. He is adaptable. Like he'll work around maybe your faults or your strengths. Like he's always all for your strengths. Um, he works with what you got. And then like he's respectful. He doesn't, he's like, I wouldn't say he's my personal coach, but I do go to him a lot, but he wouldn't push for me to be in teams because he's realistic also. Like he doesn't promise things that he can't offer, which I think, and we're also really good friends. So I guess that helps. <laughs> Uh, that's outstanding. And look, we've got a couple of questions from the guys that are on the line. So we will we'll finish up with, with those tonight. And very curious of people's times. And I think we could talk for another hour if we wanted to. There's been some wonderful things. I've written a lot of things down. I hope everyone else out there has. But um, So a couple of questions that have come in. We, we've probably touched on it a little bit, but if you can probably rephrase it, what is one of the best pieces of advice that a coach has given you? Adam, I know you mentioned a couple. So have you got one that stands out for you? Um, yeah, the, the best piece of advice is, is a lot, but, um, I, I think the best piece of advice is, that I've been given is just enjoy the game. The game was meant to be a game. Make sure you enjoy the game. Uh, over my career, I've been very competitive. Um, uh, so sometimes the competitive side of me gets, uh, gets going, but I think when a good coach for me is the one that can say, Hey, let's get out there and let's enjoy it. Um, enjoy the game is is what we're all about so sometimes you need the coach there to pull you back in and put a smile on your face and let's get out and play couldn't agree more jodes your best piece of advice from a coach oh um well yeah similar like wasn't playing not enjoying it you can get pretty hung up on whether you're going to get selected or not but at the end of the day you don't want to leave the sport hating it so yeah that would be the same advice now, one last question. Don't really want to finish on a negative, but we could also turn it into a positive. So the question is, have you ever had to work with a coach that you may not have connected with as well as others? And if you have, how did you manage that relationship? Um, I think I have had a lot of experiences, especially I think being a raw cricketer, I am a lot of coaches have tried to implement what they want to do. And as Elise Perry told me once, you just, Got to appreciate it, work with it. If it's not for you, then park it. But you have to be respectful. Take it on board. See if you never tried it, you might not know if it never worked for you. Perfect. Adam? Awesome. Um, yeah, look, I've definitely had coaches that I've um, I've, had, I've struggled with. Um, but a lot of time, and a lot of time, you do have to work with them, and a lot of that comes down to actually having the conversation and being. One thing I think that's probably helped me in my career is I've been willing to sit down with people that you know what I don't agree with what you're saying. I'm going to talk. I, I want to talk about it, and I think that they're look to be honest, they're horrible conversations to have, and they're conversations that none of us want to have. But once they've been had, I think you find you figure out what the player's thinking and you also figure out what the coach is thinking. As a player, I, I, I want to know why you keep telling me this. Like, I don't agree with it. This is the way I feel. This is my game. This is sort of what Jody's talking about. Like, this is my game. This is what works for me. And this, you're telling me something completely different. I really want you to tell me why. Um, and they're horrible conversations to have, but they've got to be had. And if you don't have them, you're not doing yourself any favours, you're not doing the player any favours, and the player's not doing the club any favours. Um, so that, that's probably the the hard conversations that no one wants to have. Yeah. And again, back to that communication, it seems to be the, the relaying theme of tonight is, is if we're communicating, some something's working well and we're building those relationships. So... Guys, that's, we've hit the 7 o'clock or just before 7. Um, absolutely fantastic. Uh, really appreciate from, from Cricket New South Wales and the Coach and Talent Specialist, you guys coming on tonight and and sparing an hour of your time to talk cricket and talk your perspective. I'm sure everyone that's on has certainly got a lot out of it. And 
Adam, go back and put your mask on. You're in Victoria at the moment, mate. So <laughs> don't cough too hard through the screen, yeah. please. I don't think. Um, you can, yeah. <laughs> and Jones, obviously, all the best with with everything at the Sixers, and and of course with with um, GWS in the AFL, and Adam with St Kilda. I suppose you just make this your last Premier Club, eh? That'd, that'd be good. <laughs> this this should be it. Yeah, guys. Uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, pass over to Nick Bills. He's, he's just going to finish off the night by saying thank you and a, a bit more information. But again, couldn't say thank you enough. So have a good night. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, thanks, guys. Thanks, Jay. And, and thanks to Adam and Jody as well. Um, that was brilliant. Really appreciate the time you've given up uh, on a Monday evening um, to give a bit of insight to all the coaches on the line. I think there's plenty in there that, that I certainly took out of it, and I know that the coaches on the line will as well. I think the probably the two biggest things that stood out for me that stood out for you in coaches was the communication and also the care. Like the coaches that can communicate well and show they've got care for the players and also know players as well. Like Jody touched on it a couple of times. Um, actually knowing the player and knowing what their strengths are and trying to communicate their strengths while working in and trying to improve their weaknesses as well. So, no, I really appreciate your time, guys, and um, thank you very much. Just for, for those on the line, just a little bit of information. We've got, obviously, next week's session we've got with uh, Alan Mantle, uh, works with Enhanced Mind Performance. Um, he's going to give a bit of a run-through around, obviously, helping players deal with potentially things that are going on in their lives at the moment. It's been a, a difficult last couple of months for everyone, um, given the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So... Alan will be on the line. And for those um, coaches or administration staff working with male premier clubs, at the end of that session, we'll just keep on keep on the same call. But uh, we're going to have Roy Formica uh, on, who's been happy, uh, nice enough. He's going to answer questions of coaches um, and or staff that you may have leading into the season. Obviously, there's still a lot of unknown with everything that's going to be with everything that's going on, but uh, Roy's going to jump on the line at the, for the last 15 minutes, about 7 o'clock-ish, like it is now, and, and for 15 minutes he'll uh, answer those questions. I'll be in touch tomorrow with an email and a form uh, just for you to be able to type those questions rather than have it um, as a Q&A on Teams. We'll have the questions and I'll have the questions there ready for Roy, but it might some of them may need uh, more than 30 seconds notice for an answer. So... Um, just a, a heads up, I'll remind you in emails during the week and when I send out the meeting request that that'll be going ahead. But if you just keep an extra 15 minutes for next week, um, to, if you've got any questions for Roy and potentially competitions or formats or whatever it might be, um, he's, he's going to be willing to answer them next Monday. So um, without any further ado, thank you again, guys. Much appreciated. Um, everyone, have a great night. Have a great rest of the week. And we, I look forward to catching up with you uh, this time next Monday. Perfect. Thanks, guys.